Hey folks, welcome back to 3 Zen. Bobo here. 1977, uh, August, late August, I had just gotten home, heading to the refrigerator to grab a cold beer, and I got a call from my boss, uh, Chief of Safety, and Don Ross at the time, and Don said, hey Bob, he said, I just got a call that uh, you've been selected to be the investigator on a, a T-38 crash at... Uh, at Shepard and he says you know the drill pack for 28 days and when you get out the base we'll have a jet for you so I packed went out there and they had the jet and the CNI IP take me down there and then fly the jet back and uh, that was the start of uh, the investigation when I got down there I learned that both pilots had been one pilot had been killed and the other one was severely injured. So I thought to myself, great, we got somebody we can talk to to kind of get an idea of what happened to begin with. Well, as it turns out, um, these guys were setting up for a loop. They had 500 knots on the airplane and just bringing on the G at the, the base of the loop here. And as they started up, the left wing failed. But they didn't know that. They just uh, felt an uncommanded... Um, left roll. So what had happened is um, the left wing had failed and the right wing started rolling over. The IP commanded bail out. He went out and then he was followed shortly thereafter by the student. The IP had a parachute malfunction so his chute failed to, to work and um, he was killed. The guy in the front seat just had bloody bad luck that day. As he came out of the aircraft, the man's seat separator, which we call the butt snapper, it, it, it pushed him out of the seat, so he separated from that okay. His chute opened, and as the chute blossomed and started opening, the seat caught up, went through the chute, down the risers, and hit him on his left shoulder. Crap! And what it did is it hyperextended his uh, head and his body, and it tore a a bunch, a bunch of nerves up here in his shoulder. He, and he lost um, uh, function of his left hand. I went in and took a look at him thinking that I might be able to, uh, we might be able to uh, talk to him about the accident at that time, but oh man, he was no, I just, there was no way we we're going to talk to him. Um, he was one hurting puppy. So, that evening and early the next morning, the investigation team uh, assembled. The president came in, uh, a guy named Randy Billingham, and I really like Randy. Um, the, a couple of um, civilians from um, Kelly came up, and one came up from Oklahoma City, and an engine specialist and so forth. Okay, so we assembled the team, and um, the next day we got out to the uh, accident site, and the airplane had hit kind of flat, but like on it, it pancaked on its left side, if you will. Just kind of, it, it became like a fallen leaf here and just kind of went down like that once it lost all its energy. The left wing we found about four, four and a half miles, if memory serves, back behind. Okay, so that's what we had. Now we knew that there was an issue with what they called the critical wing root radius. And what that was, that was a, re a radius created in the wing to allow a flange to, to protrude back toward the aft part of the airplane. And that they needed that to attach the speed brake package. For the purpose of this discussion, that's all we need to know. Then that radius was the uh, critical point. Because it was only a half inch, um, it... it Held, held a lot of stress when we were doing our maneuvers and that's exactly what happened this day. Now what they wanted us to do was to look for uh, tool marks in that uh, wing root radius. They'd found some airplanes that had tool marks uh, from manufacture in there and those things should not be in there because if you're going to have fatigue it's going to it's going to find a home in one of those tool marks and start to grow until it eventually fails. And that's exactly what happened in this case. It emulated out of one of those uh, tool marks. And the wing, once it started to fail, there's a line of um, 
uh, rivets, and it just went from one to the other to the other. But it happened almost instantaneously. There's nothing you can do about it. Just bail out and hope the damn seat doesn't doesn't hit you. Okay. So the thing came down and pancaked on the ground. What I wanted to tell you today uh, was not so much about the accident, but about the investigation. Just fascinating. Fascinating what I learned um, on these investigations. The uh, lead investigator from Kelly Air Force Base um, was a guy named Don Morgan. Great guy. Just a great guy. Don was about 6'2 or 6'3. Kind of unassuming initially when you met him. Uh, he was a GS-79 or some damn thing like that. He was way up there. Um, and uh, he just knew so much about the 38. It was, I, I followed him around like a little puppy dog. So we're at the accident site, and he'd pick up a piece of scrap uh, metal there. When it hit, it came apart. And he'd pick up this thing, and he'd say, okay, left fuselage just under the rear cockpit. And he'd toss it back on the ground. Now, I'm right out of school, and I thought, geez, you need to preserve all this stuff. You just don't kick it around and toss it around. You need to... And so he goes on a little bit further. He picks up another piece of scrap metal, and he looks at it, and he says, okay, this is from the right side of the aircraft on top of uh, the right engine. And he tossed it down. He did that about two or three times. I said, you officious son of a bitch. You know, what? what's this all about? And... Uh, I thought he was just pompous. Uh, <laughs> that was my first take on Don. And as usual, I was wrong. But later, when we had a chance to sit down over a cup of coffee, he was talking. He says, he says Bob, he says, remember, as we were walking through the crash site, I was picking up those pieces of scrap metal. And I said, yeah, I, actually, I do remember that. He said, remember I showed you where they had different thicknesses? Well, I said, yeah, that's fine, you know. He says, well, he said the skinning technique on the T-38 was, was uh, ingenious. And I said, how's that? He said, it was actually a skinning technique developed by Howard Hughes. Now he got my attention. I said, really? He says, yeah. He said, what Howard Hughes discovered in his, his team was you could take aluminum and you could stretch it. And when you stretched it, that's when you riveted it to the frame. Then when you took it off, released it from the jigs, the skin would, would compress, and that's what gave that fuselage the, uh, the strength it did. And by doing that, you could get away with building an airplane that was a little bit lighter than what you would normally need if you just took sheets of metal and then riveted them on every, every so often. So that's what they did. They took... Um, the aluminum, they stretched it a little bit, and then they uh, riveted it to the airframe. And he went on to tell me that uh, he presented the idea to the uh, Army Air Corps before World War II, but they just kind of blew them off. Okay, somehow the Japanese picked up on it, and that's the way they built their Japanese Zeros. That's why the Zeros were really lightweight, one of the reasons. Um, and then he said, do you ever see... <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, you ever see um, gun camera film from World War II when the guy shoots down a zero? He says, Init initially, the airplane, when it when it's hit, it starts to uh, twinkle a little bit, and then it just the, air, the whole thing just comes apart. He says, what they've done is they've destroyed the integrity of that airplane under, um, under the tension it was. It also, a contributing factor was that Japanese airplanes didn't have self-sealing uh, fuel tanks. But the big thing was that uh, the skin was under tension. And he pointed out another thing. He said, when you see that, he said the edges of uh, the pieces that we picked up were very jagged. And that's because it just, it doesn't, it doesn't fail regularly with a regular straight line. It, it just kind of rips all around and then it comes apart. And he went on to tell me, he said, you got to be very careful with that because he said, if you cut your, yourself with that, he says, you want to get attention right away because of the different chemicals in that uh, raw metal. Okay. Well, I think what happened, the, the way Don and I became friends, and we, we built a friendship on that uh, investigation that lasted for 
10, 15 years until I left the Air Force. Um, but we were in one of our evening meetings, and Don, we're sitting there trying to put this article, this accident into uh, context. And Don said, well, he says, I think what we're dealing with here, the scenario, and he went on and on a little bit, and Colonel Billington sat there a minute and looked looked around, and he looked at me and said, what do you think, Bob? And I'll tell you what, I apologize again. I said, I think, I think Mr. Uh, Morgan is full of shit. <laughs> it's always been a problem when he asked me what I think I'm liable to tell you. So <laughs> Morgan snaps his head and looks at me, and he says, and why would the young captain think that? So I said, well, sir, I said, let's take what you're proposing here and work backwards with, from it, or with it. So I said, in order for us to come to where you're, you're proposing, we'd have to have this, this, and this, and this going backwards. And what we had was this. So Don sat there for a minute looking at me, and I thought, oh, crap, here's where I get tossed off the accident board. And Don looks at me for a minute, and he looks over at Colonel Billington, and he says, sir, he says, uh, in retrospect, I think the young captain's right. I am full of shit. <laughs> and we just became the best of friends. I I would go over to Kelly every now and then. I'd come up with some kind of excuse when I was stationed at Randolph and uh, in flight safety oh, a couple years later. And I'd drive over to Kelly, have a cup of coffee just to talk with him and Gary Parks and a couple other guys. They were just fascinating men to talk to. And they knew so much. I think Don, when he was very young, was on, um, he played a small part in the orig original design of the 38. So it was just fascinating to pick his brain. Um, one later aside, uh, one other aside on this, um, we had an engine man um, specialist. His, la his name was Rolf. He was uh, German. He had a real thick German accent, and he was a, another great guy. Uh, he'd come to America before the war, and he worked um, on the B-25 as a, a young electrical engineer. And one night at the uh, at uh, happy hour, he took a, a napkin and drew out the whole electrical system of the B-25 on that, on that uh, cocktail napkin. It was just fascinating to watch. But he was a meticulous kind of guy, just meticulous. So... We needed to. We knew the wing failed, okay, but we still had to look at other components. One, a uh, couple of them being the engines. So Rolf um, had a couple of airmen working for him, and he had the engines. We pulled them. They were both on dollies, and he said, uh, "Okay, V need to take this cover off." So from about eight thirty to about eleven thirty, twelve o'clock, these guys were. And it wasn't just easy as unbolting because those things had been pranged and they were bent and everything else. But So they worked on it for about three, three and a half hours getting um, the top cover of the compressor section off. And so they got it all loosened up. And, I mean, these guys are working their hearts out on this thing. Anyway, they get it all off and they're ready to lift it off. And Ralph says, no, if he go to the lunch now. So <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Work all morning. You want to take lunch? Okay, fine. So they went off to lunch. Well, when they went off to lunch... Don Morgan slips in, and he had a, a fork for, that he'd gotten from the mess hall, and he took a pair of pliers. He bent that fork in all different directions. He said, hey, Bob, pull the engine. So I pulled the, a couple guys helped me with that. So we pulled the uh, engine cover off. He takes that fork and shoves it in the compressor section. We shove the, put the, the cover back on, and then we're just kind of standing around when Rolf and his, his crew comes back. Rolf says, okay, V, take the lid off and see what we have. So he had his glasses on. These two guys lift the uh, cover off, and he's sitting there poking around. Like, and then he finally gets up to the, the compressor section or whatever where it was. He sees that fork that, <laughs> and it just shocked as hell to see it. Anyway, just something to break the monotony, I suppose. And a little bit more about the T-38 that perhaps you didn't know that I found fascinating. Just love, and even to this day, I love seeing things and learning things about that airplane. It was such a magnificent airplane to fly. And uh, 
For those of you that are new to the Air Force, uh, perhaps as a new student or a new instructor now assigned to fly in the 38, um, I have flown both, okay? And it flew so much better than it, when it was painted white. God! Anyway, just, uh, just my thoughts on that subject. And I, I will be having more to say about that. Of course you would. At any rate, uh, Bobo here, base gear stop. Take care.